The following is a segment from our hour-long PL Voices Clinical Recommendations webinar held on December 11, 2013, and discusses New American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guidelines for treatment of cholesterol and the assessment of cardiovascular risk. This one is led by session moderator and PL editor, Dr. Sherry Bowringer. You'll hear the voices of Drs. Steve Nissen, Doug Pau, Craig Williams, and Joe Sugar. You'll also hear the voices of cardiologists and contributing authors to the new guidelines, Drs. Neil Stone and Donald Lloyd-Jones. And I'm delighted to say that we are joined by two of the cholesterol guideline authors today. Those are Drs. Neil Stone and Donald Lloyd-Jones, both from Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. And we're also joined by Steve Nissen, a cardiologist from Cleveland Clinic, and as well as Craig Williams from Oregon Health Sciences University. So welcome to you all. Before we get started, I wanted to talk just a little bit about one of the big changes that we've seen in the guidelines, and that is we've all heard we will no longer be aiming for those specific LDL targets. I think that we're all used to going for an LDL target of less than 100 in a lot of patients, but we're not going to do that anymore. So Dr. Stone, I'm wondering if you can get us started by telling us what the rationale is behind this change. Thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to talk. Our new guidelines sought to align our recommendations as close to the evidence as possible. So we were only allowed to look at papers chosen by an independent group that were rated for quality. And two of our questions were, what was the evidence that LDL or even non-HDL goals should be used as targets in order to guide therapy? And frankly, we couldn't find evidence for any number, not 90, not 100, not 70. Instead, we found strong evidence for the intensity of therapy that worked. Our guidelines are about proven therapy, and the most proven therapy after this enormous task of reviewing thousands of articles was that they were statins. Many large-scale studies have shown in randomized controlled trials where they were compared against placebo that statins over a wide range of LDLs reduced the risk of heart attack and stroke, and in many cases even improved total mortality. So the new focus is not on a specific LDL target. It's on using statins designed to lower LDL in concert with an optimal heart-healthy lifestyle. Okay, well thanks Dr. Stone for that explanation. And turning to you now, Dr. Nissen, I know you've had some concerns about this particular recommendation or this change in focus. Can you tell us what those are? There are a couple of them. First of all, by and large, this first section of your report today is actually pretty much everybody agrees about. Mm -hmm. An example would be anybody in a secondary prevention population certainly ought to be treated. People with diabetes ought to be treated. But the elimination of the targets is controversial. And it's controversial right. partly because we've had, you know, 20, 25 years where we've told people to treat the goal. Mm -hmm. Patients have come to know what their levels are, were recommended. Doctors have used this as a way to motivate patients. And so it's a pretty big shift. I called it a tectonic shift in thinking. I understand the source of the evidence, but I also have some concerns about the extent to which it may produce some confusion amongst practitioners and amongst patients. And it also is an issue about what do you do with the patient who you put on a statin, who's the LDL still very high? You know, do you add right. additional therapies and why? Okay, those are great questions. And Dr. Stone, I'm going to have you reply in just a moment. But first, I wanted, Doug, as a primary provider, what are your thoughts about this shift from looking at LDL goals to just specific doses? Do you think that this will be a challenge for you in your practice? One of my concerns is with the side effects of statins and with the going to the highest dose. I mean, I think the risk is higher when you start with higher dose of the people getting myalgias and myopathy, and especially the myalgias. And as a primary care provider, I have a lot of patients that desperately need statins who have bad outcome with symptoms, and then it's a lot more energy to try to get them back on the drug. So one of my concerns is making sure that, that the the therapy is successful by getting it into the patient. And so that was one of the things that this struck me was when you go with a dose, like, you know, just start the person on a higher dose right. of a potent statin. 
that that, that may be an issue. Okay, Dr. Stone, can you reply to that? Your thoughts I would on that? like to. I would like to. We were struck by very little press on Figure Four. Figure four in our guideline that we thought we put a lot of time and thought into says there needs to be a patient or clinician patient discussion before any statin prescription is written, in primary prevention especially. And we felt that was key. This is where the physician judges the total risk picture, including other ASCBD risk factors, uh, the, the predilection of the patient to have risk factors, is there a prior history, is there a family history of statin uh, problems? In fact, we indicated that should be looked at before the statin is prescribed, the intensity of statin is prescribed to review statin safety issues and a consideration of the patient preferences. We think that our guidelines don't mandate statins for a large number of people as much as they mandate a careful appraisal of how statins can help a large number of people in primary prevention. And it's clearly there in, in Figure 4 where you can't get to the statin prescription without that box. And the point is that there are people who, who don't tolerate statins well, and we give a lot of advice in the guidelines for how to deal with that. But if the patient's going to say to you, what do I need to do to reduce my risk of heart attack and stroke in the four areas? And, and Steve outlined them beautifully, those with uh, known mm -hmm. ASCVD, those with elevations of LDL above 190 for primary reasons, those with diabetes, and even those with more than 7.5% risk, those are groups where the data says they benefit. But the key is that risk discussion with the clinician and the patient, because here's where we find out what statin can be used, and most importantly, uh, how to do it effectively. Remember the statins are inexpensive. Five out of seven are available as generics, so we're hoping cost would not be an issue. And they are safe if given properly, but if the patient would not have qualified necessarily for a clinical trial, if there are any issues that could raise a red flag and they're written in the report, then we think this is a discussion where the, the physician's going to need clinical judgment to decide how best to use it. And when I hear the patients will be confused about not having a goal, I saw two patients this morning just this morning in my lipid clinic who were short of what were the old goals. Uh -huh. Instead of giving them another drug because they were short of the old goals, I asked them a simple question. Let's talk about how many days per month you actually took your medication. It turns out both of them had missed two weeks of their statin. So they weren't short of the goal. They were short of taking their medication. We think there's right. going to need to be follow-up lipids, but it's going to focus on adherence. How many patients who take all cardiovascular drugs take all their medicines? The number is disappointing, I think, based on a number of the sources. Our focus on adherence is going to make a big difference. And frankly, if, if you're a patient taking a high-intensity statin and tolerating an effective lifestyle and your LDL 78, some people would have added another drug to get them to 68, but there's no evidence right. for benefit. Okay. I think what I'm hearing you say is that you need to individualize therapy. Exactly. And look at the That's what our patient. guidelines are okay. about, personalizing. Okay. I think Neil beautifully discussed what's there in the document. And, and I would add just a little bit that, of course, it does help us intensify our efforts at lifestyle if we think the patient is fully adhering to the medication and we're not getting there. And we certainly in the document don't rule out the addition of further medications, particularly in those very high-risk patients, if you really want to try to get the LDL lower. And I think there are certainly a number of patients where I would continue to aggress. But I think that primary care docs and cardiologists need to understand we don't have an evidence base for doing that. You're treating the LDL number. We think lower is generally better. But you have to be frank with the patient that you're adding a medication that you don't have evidence is going to be effective over and above their maximally tolerated dose of statin. One thing about the guidelines that I really like is the emphasis on not, not using non-statins. Right. It's been exasperating to see the number of patients treated with fibrates, niacin, fish oil, who don't, in fact, most of the patients taking fish oil don't even meet the FDA label requirements of having a, you know, a triglyceride level of over 500. And so these are being used as a substitute for therapies for which we have a lot of evidence of reductions in morbidity and mortality. So, you know, I think everybody 
think that's a great idea. I wanted to mention mm -hmm. a patient and give you an example of a patient I saw today. Just a where, second, Steve, yeah, before you hey, get to your patient, I just hey. want to stay on the tangent there of adding drugs to statins because we have a recommendation about that lower in our article about how in general you don't want to do that in most patients, but as Don was saying that occasionally you, it is okay if they don't seem to be getting the impact that you want from the statin, but it's important to note that there's not evidence yeah. to support it. Do you think we got our recommendation right there? Yes, the, the key thing is okay. the patients with LDLs 190 or more of a primary yeah. basis, they, most of them are going to have familial hypercholesterolemia. Right. So even on a maximal statin, their LDLs are way too high. And yeah. what we've said in those cases is that getting the LDL lower with non-statin therapy is not unreasonable, but as Don said, you have to realize that now you're you're not in the strong evidence base and you want to try to use those therapies that were shown in in other randomized trials to make a difference on their own. Yeah, sure. These are all very valid points being brought up and the, we had a chance to host Neil Stone for Grand Rounds a couple weeks before these guidelines came out and I said at the time he was visiting, they're really hyper evidence based. This very much is what the evidence is, but everyone on this call accepts that LDL is still a driver of atherosclerosis and we all have some LDL number in mind that for high risk patients, if they don't get their with the highest tolerated dose of statin, we're still be willing to look at other therapies. And I think that's true for Dr. Lloyd Jones and Dr. Stone, but, but we don't have the evidence space to put that in guidelines as a reality. Okay. Uh, let me, let me Absolutely. just follow that up and just say, just say quickly, we actually have a footnote that says, for those on statin therapy, in those trials of intensive therapy where the best results were seen, LDL uh -huh. cholesterol was generally less than 100. Mm -hmm. We put that in not as a performance measure and not even as a treatment goal, but to give people an idea of what uh, uh, the trial showed. But again, right. to emphasize adherence, adherence, adherence to both statin use and, and lifestyle, why not go with the winners? And I think what we do need to do is emphasize adherence more in our set of recommendations. Now, Steve, I want to turn back to you, and you had a story to tell us about your patient. It's an example of a guy in his mid-40s with mm -hmm. an incredibly bad family history. You know, every male has had a myocardial infarction or bypass surgery in their 40s. And he came in to see me, and he had an LDL of 182. And I put him in the risk calculator, and he comes up 5% risk. Blood pressure is great. Everything else looks good. He isn't over 190, doesn't have diabetes, doesn't have disease yet. I can tell you I treated him with maximally intensive statins. And so it's important for the listeners and for your document to make certain people understand that these guidelines are just guidelines, that there are right. lots of people that fall through the cracks that absolutely should be treated. And I think you won't find very many people that would not give a guy with a LDL of 182 and an incredibly bad family history a statin at age 44. Yeah, uh -huh. Dr. Stone and I would treat that patient all day long, I assure you. And if you read the guidelines, it says once you've done the risk calculator, that's the start. And then there are six things we list that you must consider in the risk discussion, if present, as important modifiers that you should really look at in order to determine okay. whether you they, might still put a patient on statin. After the risk calculation, the treatment decision has to be colored by if they have an LDL over 160, if they have a family history of premature cardiovascular disease, if they have a high predicted lifetime risk, if, if you have it, if they have a high CRP level, or if you have it or want to do it, uh, perform a coronary calcium score and ankle brachial index. Those six factors should be considered in the risk discussion, and this guy qualifies on at least two of them, and I can assure you that the guidelines and Dr. Stone and I would both treat that patient as well. Okay. Thanks for your thoughts on that. Now, I do want to talk about the threshold a little bit because Steve alluded to it a little bit as well as you and the other factors involved. And particularly, I'm talking about for those primary prevention patients where the kind of that cutoff in most patients would be about 7.5%. And that seems like a little bit of a shift from prior guidelines that looked at a cut off of 20% for patients clearly needing a statin. So my question is, and Don, why don't you take this one? Can you tell us, and I know the risk calculators aren't exactly the same on how they define that threshold, but tell us how that 7.5% number was selected. Sure. So a risk calculator can never dictate a treatment threshold. The treatment thresholds right. that you see in the cholesterol guideline were actually discovered through very careful analysis of the pure primary prevention trials with statins, where we found that there was actually demonstrable net clinical benefit down to a predicted 10-year risk of 
but because of a number of issues, including the fact that it's possible that any risk calculator can overpredict risk, and that at 5%, you're getting close to a margin where the potential for side effects may be approaching the same as the net benefit in reducing heart attacks and strokes, we moved that back to the 7.5% threshold where right. there's clear net clinical benefit to introducing a statin for that individual if it's clinically appropriate. Okay, so in our second article, we talk a bit about that, and we say this is the point where the cardiovascular benefits of statins seem to outweigh the risk of side effects in most patients. So you would agree with that? Absolutely. Okay, great. So that 7.5% number, that makes sense. But the 20% number, like, where did that come from? Why has there been such a big change? Was that number too high? Well, you know, I think that in the 12 years since ATP3, we certainly have substantially more evidence, particularly in the primary prevention realm, that statins are clinically effective and cost-effective at much lower predicted risk levels than the old 20%. And as you pointed out, that was 20% for just hard coronary events. Right. 20% was awfully high, and we have demonstrable benefit at much lower risk levels. And Neil was on ATP3. I think he'd be the first to say that the 20% level was a relatively arbitrary selection. This time we actually went in and quantified using the clinical trial data available itself to say where were we seeing that net clinical benefit, and that's where we ended up at the 7.5% level. Okay, great. And that explains that very well. Thank you so much. Now, I do need to turn to Jill. I, Jill, we have had have audience questions coming in like crazy. Can we get to some of those? Yep, there is a flood of them. Okay, here's the first one. Based on the new guidelines, I think many of my patients aren't on the right intensity of a statin. They're probably on too low a dose. What should I do with these patients, especially if their LDL is already less? than 100. And Dr. Stone, can you take that question? That's a great question. So uh -huh. the benefit was seen over a wide range of LDLs of statin therapy. It's one of the harder concepts to, to deal with, the idea of risk reduction. And it would depend, that's where again this clinician-patient discussion is so crucial to decide if it's worth it. But some people are on a very low dose of a statin, and frankly, based on the data, you can't say they would get as much benefit as if they were on a slightly higher dose. But that may need to be made on an individual basis. If there is a strong concern over statin side effects, you may, for example, leave a person instead of, if they had a secondary prevention, they were on a TORVA 80 and you're worried about, and they were just on a TORVA 40, in our guidelines, that would be okay. But if they're just getting a torvastatin 10 in secondary prevention, then we would ask ourselves, do we really want to take advantage of some of those benefits? So I can't give a hard and fast answer. Our guidelines are designed to inform clinical judgment, not replace it. The clinician right. needs to know what the data shows where the best benefit is, and then how close you get to the benefit will depend on that. But Jerry, can I modify that question yeah. a little bit? What if the statin that they're on in that scenario is simvastatin 40, which is a pretty popular workhorse dose for us, mm -hmm. and their LDL is 90, mm -hmm. but by the guidelines, they're not on the oh, high make intensity. It, make it 70. Uh, okay, yeah, make it yeah, in, the, in the 70s. Steve, uh, Steve, I saw such a patient last week. I saw, that, that's a yeah. great question. Okay. So okay. the point is the patient was on, on simvastatin 40, and his LDL was uh -huh. 70. And, of course, okay. you want to make sure he doesn't have a real high triglyceride, low HDL, so he's got a lot of small, dense LDL particles. And so his risk is probably a lot higher, actually. But, but the point is, his LDL was 70, and I had a frank discussion. I said, under the new guidelines, you would have been given a tour of a 40. Right. We can switch. That will give you a better benefit. But you've tolerated the Simba 40. You're doing well in every respect, and you're doing perfectly on, on diet. This is why the patient-physician discussion is crucial. The patient said, I'd rather stay where I am. I'm tolerating it. So okay, it's great. not that he's against the guidelines. It's just that he's, he's making a value judgment. Okay, and I think, again, this just emphasizes the point that you need to individualize therapy for each Absolutely. and every patient. Absolutely. I think, okay. really, too, Sherry, that, that not everything in that table is, I wouldn't consider it the same. I don't, I don't necessarily think being on Prava 40 is the same, or Resuva 5 is necessarily the same as Simva 40, you look at the evidence base. Yeah, the, these are actually similar. from the guidelines. Yeah, no, I know. But, but, yeah, yeah. Are, but you know, I again, well, the, I mean, this is, again, part of the problem here is that this was an effort to make it simple. And right. simple as can be good or simple can be bad. Uh, you know, one of the things I need to say that I want to put on the table is that okay. I think there was a political mistake made here in not putting these things out for a period of public comment first. 
the controversy that arose arose in large part because all of a sudden we completely changed what we were telling people. And I think when you do that, it's very smart, as the Preventive Services Task Force does, to put the guidelines out for a public comment period, allow there to be an opportunity for people to think about it a little bit and get them explained, and then finalize them later. And I think it's mm -hmm. led to a lot of confusion, and I wish that they had not been done in the kind of, of ultra-secrecy that they were done in, which I think contributed to the pushback. Okay. What I could need I, to do now, I respond Neil? To that? Yes, absolutely. Can I just respond so, briefly? Yes. So, so yes. Steve, Steve's a very wise man and always makes good comments. But Steve, I have to tell you, our guidelines were reviewed multiple times at multiple stages by large numbers of reviewers, both from NIH and then when they went to ACC and a AHA. There was no secrecy here. Indeed, we presented exactly what we were going to do two years ago at the American Heart Association uh, session, scientific sessions. So the fact that they would be more evidence-based, the fact of how we actually did it, was obvious to many people exactly what kind of guideline would happen when you looked at the questions we asked. But what I think is great about a show like this is we need to have more people really finding out what's in our guidelines. I think the more people get to realize what's actually in the guidelines to see how physician judgment is going to be very important. The person said here that not all the statins in the moderate intensity group are the same. Well, we didn't say they're the same in terms of a lot of things. We said they lower right. the, LDL in the 30 to 50 percent range. Right. This is where physician judgment is going to be so important. And, and, and okay. we, therefore, Steve's comments are good. We need to talk about it more. We do, Sorry. and, and uh, Joe, I'm going to let you talk for 30 seconds because i got to move okay. on. Go ahead, Joe, well, real quick. To, you know, from a primary care perspective, I think these were good, informed guidelines. My group, as we read them, we felt like the newspapers did not give the lifestyle intervention enough attention, and I would even state, I love the word, is the foundation of, of lipid management, and I'd, I'd even put at the beginning of our guideline that, you know, while lifestyle intervention is the foundation of management, you know, more patients focused on statin because I don't think the press gave the report. I applaud, and I think my colleagues applaud, a broader look at the patient rather than a focus yeah. on some specific targets. Right. There's a lot of metabolic syndrome patients with very low HDLs. They don't have very high LDLs because their triglyceride and their VLDLs are so high, so the LDL is almost misleading in some of them. I think the broader look at the patient, uh, I agree with the cholesterol side effect issue. We use a lot of, you know, once a week high the dose. The statin side effects, things. yeah. Yep. I agree too, Joe. And I guess one thing that I think you just said that I really like is the focus on lifestyle. And I agree that's so important. And we will be talking a little bit about that shortly. But before we do, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on the risk calculator. That's actually our next set of recommendations just below. And Dr. Lloyd-Jones, can you just take a moment, just real quickly, to tell us what thought went into this risk calculator, how it was developed? Sure. Well, we had five years, as you know, through the process to develop it. So a lot of thought went into it, including considering, you know, what the appropriate endpoints should be and surveying actually all of the existing risk scores that were available. And we found a lot of problems with each of them. There is no perfect risk score, of course, and some of the issues we, we saw with the existing ones had to do with the endpoints, some had to do with the inputs, some had to do with the populations in which they were derived. So we didn't find one that really suited our needs, and because of that, we developed these new pooled cohort equations. And in order to make them as relevant as possible, we did a number of things. First, we used the best, most representative samples we could find that really represent the broad U.S. population. We used follow-up time from the mid-'90s forward so that they were as recent as possible. Remember, if you're going to create a 10-year risk score, you actually have to follow people for 10 years, so we can't use super contemporary cohorts. And finally, we also chose that time period because it was before there was very dense infiltration of statin prescriptions, which happened starting after 2000, which would obviously alter the natural history. We're trying to predict natural history because we know what the effects of statins are likely to be, but if you treat a lot of people downstream, 
in fact, you're not going to be able to predict the outcome because we don't know who's going to get treated when we assess them at baseline. So with all those considerations, we used four very broadly representative population-based samples and created these pooled cohort equations. And we didn't have a preconceived notion about what should go into them. We let the data tell us what the important mm -hmm. variables were. Not surprisingly, it turned out that the traditional risk factors were included. But importantly, by having stroke as an endpoint, we pick up a lot more and are able to represent a lot better the risk for uh, women and African Americans. We have, for the first time, sex and race specific equations for both white and black men and women. And you know, these equations are doing exactly what we ask them to do. And I think, as we said, they're a really nice starting point for the risk discussion that Neil mentioned, because right. we know doctors and patients do a terrible job of estimating absolute risk just by eyeball. They do a terrible right. job. And so you need a tool to get you in the ballpark and get you started, and then you color it with those other factors that we mentioned. Okay, great. And now turning to you, Steve, I know that you've had some concerns with this risk yeah. calculator. If you can just tell us what those are very quickly, and then yeah. Dr. Yeah. Lloyd-Jones, I'll have you jump in. Yeah. Well, clearly there are problems with the risk calculator, and I think if you spend a little bit of time with it, you find that out very quickly. Mm -hmm. You start putting sample patients in, you get some very odd results. One of my fellows came to me yesterday with one where the lifetime risk on this patient had a, had a blood pressure of 118 was 5%. If their blood pressure then went to 120, their risk lifetime went from 5% to 36%, and that huh. clearly can't be right. And so the behavior of the risk calculator is very odd in certain circumstances. The mistake here, in my opinion, was not publishing the risk calculator in a peer-reviewed journal to allow it to be vetted publicly, have other people test it. I know the group thinks that they got it right, but that's why we publish these things. You know, Framingham, when it was used, had been around for a long time, had been tested by others. And I think as time goes on, this risk calculator will have to be redone. Dr. Ridker, as I think everybody knows, believes that it overestimates risk substantially. Right. Whether he's right or wrong, the way to have avoided that problem was to get it out there in a peer-reviewed publication before it became something that would be affecting the treatment of tens of millions of Americans. I guess the way I've been thinking about this risk calculator, and I've thought about it a lot, is that I don't think that, that there's a perfect risk calculator out there. And this, to me, is a place to start. And then you're still thinking about your patient. Dr. Lloyd-Jones, would you agree with that? I think absolutely this is the place to start. And I think there are a couple of issues. As we said, and in fact, the lifetime risk data are published and peer-reviewed back in 2006, those are stratified risk equations for younger individuals. And so you get jumps when you put in small changes sometimes if you're at a boundary of the stratifications. That's supposed to be a framing issue. It's not supposed to you know, indicate super precision. Going from 118 to 120 is, in fact, one of those boundary conditions where on average, the group with prehypertension has a higher lifetime risk than the group with optimal blood pressure levels, in your example. In 2001, the Framingham equations were adopted and adapted for the ATP3, but they'd only been around for three years, in fact. So they weren't actually all that well vetted and tested, and that only came much later. The issue with the pooled cohort equations has come up, this suggestion that they overestimate risk. I think is confusing to me, I'd have to say, because if you plug the same numbers, let's say for this example of 60-year-old men all being over 7.5 percent, well, of course they are. I mean, if you plug those numbers into right. the old Framingham risk calculator, you get even higher risk estimates. And remember, one in three of us will die of a preventable or postponable cardiovascular event. More than 50 percent of us are going to have a major vascular event before we die. Somebody has to be at risk, and of course it turns out older people are at risk. So using this as a starting point, you know, then you have to personalize and individualize. Is the only thing putting this patient at risk their age? If that's the case, and you know, I see patients too, if that's the case, you probably wouldn't put them on a statin if they're otherwise optimized. Last week I saw a 67-year-old who was doing everything right. His 10-year risk was 12.4%. With optimal risk levels, it was about 10.3%. But I couldn't make this guy any better, and he and I both didn't think that giving him a medication was going to actually reduce his risk that much because, you know, he's already doing everything perfectly, and I think he's probably 
you know, looking at his group, he's probably not one of the people that would benefit from being on a statin. Okay, good point, Dr. Lloyd-Jones. And I see Dr. Stone, if you could make one point, please. Sure. Just real briefly, just want to emphasize the best thing about the calculator is it provides a risk discussion that shows the emphasis on all the different risk factors, African American or white, male or female, blood pressure, you go down the line, and so it really amplifies what you're going to do for the patient, and it allows an assessment of, of all the individuals as well as global risk, and that's a powerful thing for a risk calculator, and we're hoping more people will use it that way. Okay, and before we end, we've actually got a little over of the time we had, but this is such an important conversation, and I do want to get two more real quick questions, practical questions that are coming up. The first is, there are folks that are hearing the controversy about this calculator, and because of the controversy they're hearing, they don't want to use it. And they're asking, well, can we use Framingham instead? Can we stick with the old calculator? And if we stick with the old calculator, can we use the new guidelines with the old calculator? So Dr. Lloyd Joyce, can you quickly respond to that? Yeah, I think that would be a mistake. The issue we had with the old Framingham equations is that they only predict hard CHD risk, that is CHD death or non-fatal MI. When you do that, you leave an awful lot of preventable events on the table, particularly for women and African Americans. So sure, you can use them, but the truth is that the thresholds for a treatment decision would not line up exactly the same. Uh -huh. And I think you're also going to undertreat some important patients, and you may actually overtreat, particularly some men, by doing that approach. Okay, and then one more question. The guidelines actually kind of give a differentiation point for when you use a moderate and a high-intensity statin in diabetes patients. So if they're less than 7.5%, you use a moderate dose statin, high dose statin if over 7.5%. If somebody didn't want to use the calculator, would there be any rule of thumb they could use to decide if somebody needs a high intensity statin, like if they had a diabetes and hypertension, would that kind of push them over? Or is there any way that we could give them a tip to use? So it turns out that certainly above age 50, pretty much any diabetic is okay. going to have a 10 year risk over 7.5%. Okay. In the 40s, it will be more variable and it will depend more on the attendant comorbid risk factors. You know, white women would tend to need a lot more risk factors in the 40s to get over that 7.5% potentially eligible threshold, whereas generally men and African-American women don't need a lot extra to okay. get over that. So that might be a useful rule of thumb. And this might okay, be a, a variation on that, Donald, but what about using it? So for someone who only tolerates the low dose, using a statin-treated cholesterol value in the calculator, good idea. This is a wonderful question. Yeah. Do not do. <laughs> so, okay. so that's what I call reverse epidemiology. These are designed to predict prospective risk. You okay. can't plug in a treated number and get the expected Great. benefit from Thank it. you so, so, so much. That's a, do not do, yeah. I'm so glad. We are going to make sure we put that in our article. If somebody's on a statin, you can't use a calculator, right? Right. You could use their pre-treatment levels to understand, okay. you know, whether that decision was okay. appropriate, but you should not use their on-treatment levels. All right, um, Now, Great. blood pressure is a different story, as you know, because the treatment to variable is in the equation. Is that you can't do that because for blood pressure, you have a treated value and then say yes or no treated, but it was statins on, it's not the evidence base to be able to do that with a calculator? You can't do that with the calculator. We looked at putting statin in the calculator. We looked at it a lot of different ways. It doesn't work. And part of that's the biology, the way statins work, I suspect. And part of that is it just doesn't play out. You know, the benefit from statin, you can estimate based on the clinical trial data. You shouldn't try to force the calculator to do that. The issue with blood pressure is that if you look at it, treatment for blood pressure is actually a positive risk factor. It is not in the prospective equation, it's a positive risk factor. The reason for that is people who have been treated for blood pressure tend to have had it longer and tend to have had it higher longer. And so therefore, while the treatment is reducing their risk, it's still an indicator that they're a higher risk individual. Right. Okay, great. Thank you for listening to this segment from our PL Voices Clinical Recommendations webinar series.